Joining us here on the Rich Eisen Show uh, is the man of the hour, as I referred to him when he kindly answered his phone, absolutely knowing probably why I was calling him <laughs> earlier here on Tuesday. He's Ian Rappaport, uh, my colleague from the NFL Media Group. How are you, Ian? I thought you were just calling to make sure I was okay after the uh, thrashing from Jerry Jones. Well, you got smoked. You said you were smoking ribs today. I guess you got smoked, you know? Uh, I am smoking ribs, as a matter of fact. Just put three racks in the pit barrel smoker uh, with a little apple uh, little apple sort of flavored wood at the bottom. Um, so a lot of good things going on there. Um, <laughs> as far as Jerry Jones, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think – you know, five or six or seven years ago, maybe I would have been upset by this. It was a very mean thing to say. Um, but I believe my information. I've talked to many people involved. It's been two days, and the Cowboys have not even made an offer to Earl Thomas, which you would think if he was someone, a free agent they wanted, that they would make an offer. Uh, I do not expect them to make an offer. So that's kind of where we stand. I get it. Um, Jerry Jones is awesome and can say whatever. Um, but I trust my information as well. Well, Ian, it's interesting. You you get the same uh, emails as I do from the stellar NFL media group uh, news desk, which is on top of everything. And I got an email over the weekend pointing out that Gerald McCoy um, and the way that um, uh, his season unfortunately ended saves the Cowboys about three and change on the cap. Redoing Tyron Smith's contract saved them $7 million on the cap. You add it right. all up together, and that sounds like a nice $10 million spot for someone of Earl Thomas's caliber in a place where Earl has made it very well known he wants him. And um, you put two and two together, you come up four. Why, why would the Cowboys not be interested in Earl Thomas? Uh, so, yes, you are right about that. Um, the... The Cowboys' conversion of Tyron Smith's base salary to a signing bonus actually was – that had been in the works for several weeks. Yep. So it was really just a matter of time. That actually came before the Gerald McCoy injury. I mean, it was processed after. Yes. But the plan to do it came before. Um, I don't think it's about money. I get the sense it's more, are we sure that we want to bring some – like, he's a great player. He is a great player. But are we sure that we want to bring – everything that he has done into the locker room. And that's, you know, I mean, one hand he's a pro bowler. On the other hand, you've had two very good, very respected, consistently winning organizations decide that they would prefer to have him not play safety for them. Um, that is concerning. And I think for, you know, Mike McCarthy, when he's got, you know, he's got Ha Clinton Dix, who's not Earl Thomas. He's got Darian Thompson, who actually has played really well in camp, but also not Earl Thomas much cheaper, don't present the issues that Thomas presents. I think that's probably more what's going on here than anything. Well, uh, then let's uh, let's get a little bit more under the hood here about Earl Thomas. What what in the world is going on? I mean, uh, you know, Mike Silver, whose information is as uh, excellent as anybody else's in the business, and I don't discount it at all, you know, reporting that he – did he really, did Earl Thomas really tell, and when, by the way, when I say that again, as I said on yesterday's show, I'm not calling Mike Silver's um, uh, information into question, but Earl Thomas's uh, thought process, did he really tell the Ravens or Harbaugh or his coach, like, you know, I need more time to get my car washed in between practice and a, and a meeting? Did that literally come out of Earl Thomas's mouth? Yeah, I would never defend anyone doing anything like that, but I would say it is difficult to get your car washed when you're working all the time. I mean, they have companies that actually come to your house and do it. That's a little more expensive, but that can be really beneficial. Um, I would say next time that's what I would recommend if, if that was like the option of meetings or car wash. Um, now, to be fair, I only drive like 10 miles a week at most, so go, I'm not a big car wash guy. Um, but anyway... I don't doubt Silver's information. Right. I did not know that specifically, but I don't doubt his information. Um, it's not it's not great. Um, there's definitely some some stuff there, and I think for teams, you know, who have to investigate spending, look, it's a pandemic, and no one wants to spend any money, right? Like the Cardinals just invested a whole bunch of money in Buda Baker. He is their own guy. His character is impeccable. He's a great player, and he's young. Those are the kind of players you spend money on. Earl Thomas is also a great player, but is older, is expensive, and has had some issues 
in a pandemic, you see teams hold on to their wallet much tighter than you otherwise might. I, I guess. Then you just see Buda Baker hit the jackpot. But again, um, you know, at the safety position, which, by the way, according to Brockman, I did not see this. That caused Jamal Adams to trend. Right, Chris? When sure the, did. The Baker, I yeah, mean, Buda Baker not trending. Jamal Adams Jamal trending. Jamal Adams trending. Yeah. I mean, so For that, real? Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah, I put those those uh, facts together. His Jamal, I mean, you know the Seahawks are going to have to pay Jamal Adams based on what they gave up for him. So that that's, sure. you know. But, um, you know, I, I want to put a pin in that for a second to return to this whole scenario. So, you know, it, that this is why you infuse your language in your end of the business with expected to. There are no plans. You know, you don't say right. anything, you know, with uh, with certainty. And yet you did you did you did put the crying emoji at the end of like you poured one out for the Earl Thomas well, cowboy well, relationship. Really the, oh, I know that. But do you think that's what set off Jerry? I mean, what do you think set him off on this whole subject, Ian? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I know he was I know he was on the radio planning to talk about Earl Thomas. Sure. So, I mean, and I knew he knew he was going to be asked about Earl Thomas. I mean, did I? Did I ruin it by going on early? Uh, maybe. I think that's possible. I don't know that, but I'm just I'm just trying to think what would get him so upset. I mean, I also was surprised when he came after me for my Dak Prescott report, which was clearly true. So, I, I mean, remind I everyone know. what that was for. Um, remind everyone what that was about, Ian. So, in November on Game Day Morning, I reported that Dak Prescott was going to get franchise tagged at the end of the year, which honestly to me seemed obvious. I knew what was going on. The talks were nowhere. They weren't going to pick up. He was getting tagged regardless. And Jerry said he has no idea what he's talking about. And it was weird to me because I was like, okay, well, first of all, like I do. Second of all, everyone knows he's getting tagged, so okay. And I mean, for a few of the Cowboys, it's been two and a half days. You haven't made an offer to, you know, the top free agent out there, which means he could sign with anyone at any point before you even make an offer, that is a pretty solid indication that he's not at the forefront of your thinking. So I, I don't I don't know what set him off. Um, he should just call me and we should talk about it, but I, <laughs> I really don't know. Your number is, uh, you can access it, but I guess, you know, I, if I had to guess, and, you know, we're, we're, we're walking on that tightrope of, of supposing what uh, Jerry Jones is thinking here on uh, – four different uh, live distributions actually in to you know to put a fine point on it that maybe yeah i mean rich i i think i think we should mention before you go on yes um this is my first time on the peacock okay yep have you done anything to uh, commemorate this momentous day well i have this uh large stack of post-it notes with a peacock logo on all four sides that i can send to you so you can write post-it notes and remind yourself not to piss jerry jones off and post it on the fridge you know can be that simple. If you send that, I will put that on the Instagram. Uh, i done. Absolutely done. Uh, I hope uh, the problem is, though, is I don't want to create a problem with my staff, is Del Tufo gets really pissed that he's not getting these things. That's, that's, that's um, true. And yeah. I don't – this may this may create a rift. And, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate that, Mike. There you go. Playing him off. Yeah. <laughs> you just <laughs> played him off. I'm kidding. Don't you just oh, sabotage that him? Off. But uh, – I forgot what I even asked you after we went on this podcast. Oh, yeah. So I, if I had to, if I had to guess, again, he's the owner, and he's the guy who makes the final decisions. So, you know, um, it, it's not as if uh, any coach in the history of the Dallas Cowboys has ever received a player that he wasn't totally sold on because Jerry wanted it and thinks it's best for the team. And also, in the case of Dak, you know, for you to say that in November, he might be sitting there thinking, how does he know I'm not just going to cough up the money sometime in January? He doesn't know my negotiating strategy. If I had to guess, that's probably what he's thinking. He could change the tenor of any conversation about any player about the Dallas Cowboys as he wishes at any time he wishes is essentially what his point might be. Ian. And he's right. He's the owner. I mean, I remember, you know, there was – I was reporting on some player was choosing between two teams, and I knew that he was going to go the other way. So I reported that he was expected to sign with this one team. And I get a call from the GM of the other team, and he says, why would you report that? And I said, well, he's, you know – He's going to choose the other team. And then the response was, well, you don't know what we're going to offer. And I said, I, I know what you've offered. And he's turned that down. He's going the other way. And then the follow-up was, well, yeah, but we could just increase the offer. And I'm like, well, yes. Technically, anyone can do anything. Technically, Jerry could just write a huge check, pay Earl Thomas $40 million over one year and get it done. 
Um, but that's not expected to happen. No. So here we are. <laughs> it's not expected to happen. It's it, as opposed to we're, we're, we're no longer crying emoji pouring one out. Um, okay, so last one for you. What else is the biggest story that's going on? The false positives that happened earlier this week and what the NFL is planning to do to make sure if something that rare event, as they have referred to it uh, now through a statement, uh, happens again, are, are they going to start testing players, final testing for a game on a Friday and then quarantine everybody before kickoff? Is that essentially what the plan is going to be, Ian, for the season? Uh, I, I don't know if they're going to do it on – I don't know if they're going to do it on Friday. Um, I know that's been discussed. What, what I think the biggest takeaway from all of this is something the NFL is going to work with these, these labs and with um, bioreference, their testing partner on, is making sure that let's say, let's say Tom Brady is walking into the facility on Sunday morning. You know, he gets there at, you know, 930 or something. We, we show him rolling through the stadium with his cool, like, stupid vest or whatever. And then he gets a, a health check, and his temperature's over, and then they test him, and he's positive. Okay, well, there's going to be a test. There's a saliva test now that can have results in a matter of hours. There's also some other point-of-care tests that can have results faster than that. The NFL is going to work toward clarifying and confirming those results as fast as they possibly can. So if this happens on a Saturday night at a team hotel, if this happens Sunday morning walking into the stadium, you can make sure that if someone's going to be held out, he's really going to be positive. I think that's the main thing that is going to be discussed here. How quickly can you find out test results to confirm that a guy you think is COVID positive actually is? Right, and uh, we had George Kittle on yesterday and um, and Belichick as well. He was the first guest here on our Peacock um, quadcast. And, you know, Kittle said he he's confident that if everybody follows the rules – of engagement outside of the facility that there can be a full NFL season without interruption. And Belichick basically yeah. also said, you know, look, they, they talk about all the time about personal responsibility, and I'm sure he's delivered a very stark message to the team about uh, having your entire life be about your football life. And as long as everybody can figure that out in the NFL for four and a half, or if they're so fortunate, six months out of their lives to have their entire life be about their football life, we can have a football season. Uh, but I am holding my breath, to be honest with you, that ever since full pads go went went on uh, about eight days ago, this is when you can start seeing the manifestation of some sort of uh, somebody showing signs of COVID if they picked it up. This is I'm I'm kind of getting a you know I'm, if we can get through this week, you know, with the same results that we heard. I guess Dr. Alan Sills said yesterday, the chief medical officer, between the 12th and the 20th, no COVID positive tests at all. Um, is this the general Amazing. sense you're, you're hearing from from everybody in the NFL about the season? Yeah, I mean, it's all good, right? So the fact that there's been no player test positive over the last seven days is amazing, and it also makes sense because, like, that was part of the thought process here. And I know, you know, I, I don't mean to say that, you know, players who opted out didn't have a reason to. Everyone has their own personal reason to. And I really, you know, I really don't know the personal reasons for a lot of players. But as I heard the opt-outs, those that were not specifically health-related, the thing I kept thinking was, I imagine these facilities are going to be some of the safest places on Earth. Like, you're tested all the time. You have a million medical experts making sure that everything is clean. Everyone's social distanced by, by rule. I mean, it is, it is insanely safe. So I think that is one thing that's going to keep the NFL on the field. But, but Rich, I would say my main thing is, yes, like we're going to start – I think it's all going to be good. The issue to me is, let's say you have a two and sixteen, and you know the coach is on his way out, and things are going bad. Do guys just start going out and say screw it? And then if that team, you know, if someone has a positive test because they kind of somehow, you know, don't show up in a pregame screening, does that person then play an undefeated team, and then you have a real problem? So that would be my only thing where I'm like. Everyone needs to keep on this because if you have a team that stop, starts saying, oh, who cares, you know, and slacks off, that could affect everyone. Mm. The You know, the old backing up the U-Haul, as Dion would always call it, players just backing up the U-Haul, getting ready to just move out, bec you know, for the season because they know their season's yeah. over. If if uh, players get lax on that front, yeah, I that would be um, disheartening, to say the least. 
you know. Um, so let's end. Uh, let's end on a on an upbeat note. How else uh, can you get into trouble before I let you go? Uh, Ian, you want to talk about Dez? You want to talk about Dez's possibility coming back? And is, what, what, I guess what, what's the what? Uh, let's do that. What's the what's the uh, what's the Dez? okay? What's the what's the scoop here? What what happened with Baltimore and why did he walk out without a contract? Um, I would say um, I'm going to keep keep my eyes peeled on that one. I heard the workout was pretty good. Okay. Um, he obviously wasn't signed, so it couldn't have been that that good or maybe it's an issue of money but i was told it's something they're going to keep in touch on now one issue is when he leaves as you know he's out of the you know sort of pseudo bubble right so if he comes back he has to go through testing again and it's another five days or so until he can actually be in the building and practice so like you're starting to come to a little time now before the season if players are going to be on the team before the season like they're going to need to sign soon like you had just for instance, like Stephon Gilmore with the Patriots left camp for a personal matter, came back, needed to spend four days going through testing just to get on the field again. Missed one day, ended up missing five days. So, you know, Dez's window is kind of running out. But um, I would say his workout was pro- was pretty good. Um, and I'd be curious if other teams that have other receiver workouts are going to take a look at him. I just haven't heard that they are yet. All right, Ian. This was uh, a, an excellent uh, chat. I appreciate it. You sound great. Um, it's not an easy day when uh, when you have uh, a Hall of Fame owner basically say, "What, what did ba- what did he say, Mike Del Tufo?" He doesn't know what he's talking about. That's exactly that. Um, oh, yeah. And mm. and hey, that should be your ringtone. Make it your ringtone, or, or you know, own it. You know, when what I'm Jerry saying? calls me, I'll set it. I'll set it to ring. <laughs> it's your text tone, exactly. Um, and as you know, um, uh, 14 years ago, um, Al Davis called out your predecessor in your role at the NFL Network, Adam Schefter, as a false rumor monger, saying basically the same thing that uh, Jerry Jones said, saying that uh, uh, Adam couldn't have gotten his information from a reliable source because there's only one reliable source and he doesn't trust Adam. That does ring true a little bit. It does sound a little bit similar to what we heard and today. And he was right, wasn't he? He certainly was. Art Shell was indeed no, no no longer the coach of the Raiders after 2006. That is correct. He was right. Yeah. That's a, that's <laughs> that's a phone drop. That's a phone drop. Thanks for the call, Ian. You take care of yourself, brother. All right. That's take Ian care. Rapport, my colleague from the NFL Media Group. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.